Good evening and welcome to tonight's Chesapeake Urology webinar series. I'll introduce tonight's speaker for tonight. It's Dr. Richard Levin. Dr. Levin has been in the private practice of urology since 1995. His special interests include minimally invasive treatments for prostate cancer, kidney stone disease, and for benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, including Resume. Dr. Levin was named a Resume Center of Excellence in January 2020. He is only the second Resume Center of Excellence in the United States and the first in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. He has performed more than 300 Resume procedures for men with BPH. Dr. Levin is a member of the American Neurological Association, the American Medical Association, and the Fellow of the American College of Sur Surgeons. In 2018, Dr. Levin passed a Certified Principal Investigator exam for clinical research trials. Dr. Levin, I'll turn it over to you for tonight's webinar. Mark, thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. I just want to give a little background. As Mark said, I've been in private practice now for 25 years. I got involved with Resume in 2013 when I was asked to be a principal investigator on their pivotal trial to get it approved in the, in the U.S., in that trial, we enrolled 196 patients. Some patients got the treatment, some patients did not, and the data was so good that the FDA approved this for the treatment of BPH in November of 2015. Since then, I have been treating a lot of patients from locally, from around the country, and, and actually around the world. It's been very interesting to be involved in urology for the past 25 years because Technology has changed tremendously in all the different fields of urology, including prostate cancer and kidney stones, but specifically today, we're going to talk about BPH. So when I first finished my training in 1995 and came out into the practice of urology, we really had only a couple of very basic medications and one primary procedure called the TERP. Uh, which I think patients used to refer to as a road rooter job. Thankfully, over the past 25 years, there have been a lot of new developments in less invasive treatments for BPH. I have been very fortunate to be practicing in this time when we can treat men for BPH in a less invasive manner. What we're going to talk about today is I'm going to talk uh, primarily about BPH, but a little bit about the prostate, and then we're gonna talk about several different treatment options and I'm gonna highlight uh, the treatment option called Resume. So what is the prostate? The prostate is a little gland that sits right below the bladder and the urethra, the channel where the urine flows, runs right through the middle of the prostate. Fairly small as a, as a young man, but as we get older, it begins to grow. The prostate is the gland that produces the fluid, the semen, that allows the transport of the sperm to uh, a woman to allow the fertilization of, of an egg and in order to have a child. So once you're done that part of your life, really the prostate doesn't do you much good. It starts to grow and in about 50% of men, it eventually uh, starts to cause some problems. So what can happen to the prostate? There is an enlargement of the prostate or it's called BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is what I'm gonna focus on today. Another condition is called prostatitis, which is an irritation or inflammation of the prostate. And then finally, prostate cancer, which is a very common cancer that we treat uh, today in the United States and, and around the world. I'm not going to spend uh, any significant time talking about those second two. We're going to talk about BPH. Let's talk about BPH. So the B is benign. It's not cancerous. P is for prostate and H is for hyperplasia, meaning the cells grow to be more than normal and larger than normal. What that growth can do is it can cause blockage uh, of the urine flow. As I showed you the urethra before, it can cause blockage of the flow of urine from the bladder to the outside. But not all enlarged prostates cause problems. Oftentimes, I will have a patient referred to me from a primary physician, a family doctor, who the patient says, well, my doctor said that my prostate feels enlarged. And just because the prostate is enlarged, if it's not blocking the flow of urine or causing any problems, then there's really no need to do anything about it. So in that case, I recommend just keeping an eye on things. What is the relationship that BPH has to prostate cancer? And there is no real relationship. 
there are men that have an enlarged prostate that don't have cancer. There are men that have a small prostate that do have cancer. And there are men that have an enlarged prostate that also have prostate cancer. There are two separate issues that we really deal with separately. And just because your prostate is enlarged doesn't necessarily mean that you're at risk for prostate cancer. Now, what about PSA? So PSA is a, a blood test that we use to predict who might have prostate cancer. Well, the problem from that is PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. So it's not prostate cancer-specific, it's prostate-specific. So men with an enlarged in the prostate and therefore more cells that can produce PSA, those men can also have an elevated PSA. So it's up to your urologist to try to determine, hey, is this PSA elevated because of prostate cancer? Um, or is it because of just the enlarged prostate? Just to show you the difference between the normal and the enlarged prostate, here is in the normal situation, the urine flows fairly easily through the prostate and out, uh, out the urethra. In the enlarged situation, uh, you can see that the prostate is closing the channel where the urine is supposed to be flowing, making it more difficult to urinate. And I'll go over some of the symptoms of BPH here in a second. What are the symptoms? Well, if you're, if you're listening to this talk and you haven't been treated for your BPH, you probably have a lot of these symptoms. So patients come to me, uh, most of the time they don't come to me and say my prostate's enlarged. They come to me and say they have frequent urination. Uh, that can be frequency during the day and or the night. They have what we call urgency or the sudden urge to urinate. They can have some burning of urination, and that's not the most common. A weak urinary flow, that's a very common symptom. Not emptying your bladder because the blockage is so severe that the bladder muscle is not able to squeeze and get all the urine uh, out of the bladder. Also, there's um, men that have trouble starting the flow of urine. Some men tell me it can take 20, 30, 40 seconds before the urine starts flowing, and then at the end, it's hard to stop the flow. It kind of dribbles out for the last 10 seconds or, or so. Finally, uh, when the BPH becomes so severe and the blockage becomes so severe, it's possible that someone would have the inability to urinate, and we call that urinary retention. And that oftentimes requires a trip to the emergency room where a catheter has to be placed to drain, drain the bladder. What we like to do is we like to try and treat the BPH before it gets to that very bad situation. So BPH definitely affects uh, quality of life. Up to 95% of men who have moderate to severe symptoms are not very happy and don't want to spend the rest of their lives like that. There is about 50% of men say that it interferes with aspects of their normal life. For instance, a lot of men tell me that they urinate right before they leave the house. They urinate as soon as they get somewhere. Or if they're going to a movie, they know that they shouldn't drink uh, many fluids. So it does affect a quality of life. Um, some men do experience sexual side effects associated with the lower urinary tract symptoms. I don't know if that's directly related to the BPH, but it's a very common situation along with BPH as men get older. And it also affects a partner's quality of life. If you're getting up three, four times at night, partner's waking up all those times, then that's going to certainly affect your, your partner's uh, life as well. So who gets BPH? Um, well, it's a very common symptom. As I said, about 50% of men by the time they're in their 60s, by the time men are in their 80s or 90s, it can affect the majority of men. This is a figure from 2010, 14 million men had urinary symptoms. I think that's actually higher. I think it's about 20 million at this point and or lack of exercise. How do we figure out who has an enlarged uh, prostate? So if there's any of my patients out there, um, you probably had some of these tests done. I'll start over here on the right side. So I usually have people fill out what's called an international prostate symptoms tour which is a seven question questionnaire that asks you about your urinary symptoms. And it can be from not at all to almost all the time. And the score goes from a zero to 35 and it's like golf, the lower the better. So that's the first way I get to see how the, how the symptoms are affecting people. There's also a question about quality of life. If you were to spend the rest of your life this way with these symptoms, how would you feel? Anywhere from delighted to very unhappy. 
And then what I do is I move on to medical history and a physical examination. We check the prostate with a digital rectal exam, and that's primarily actually not feeling for the size of the prostate. We're actually feeling to make sure that we're not worried about cancer. I will often have men do what's called a Euroflow uh, or a Eurocuff test where we measure the flow of urine and the pressure in the bladder. I'll often do a post-void residual to measure how much urine is left in the bladder after, we, after you urinate. I like to do a prostate ultrasound to measure the size of the prostate, which gives me a better sense of what treatment options might be uh, the best for a certain patient. And then finally, I like to do a cystoscopy, which is a flexible digital telescope that we insert in through the urethra in about a 30-second procedure so I can assess how the prostate looks like, how the sides of the prostate are compressing the channel, um, about 30 to 40% of men have what we call a middle lobe of the prostate, which is this piece of tissue that's kind of sticking up into um, the bladder that's akin to putting your thumb on a garden hose and blocking the flow of urine. So with all these tests, with the history, the physical examination, these tests, I can get a pretty good idea of men that have these symptoms related to an enlarged prostate or whether there's something else going on. So what about treatment? First, treatment is behavior modification. People kind of do that on their own. Like I said, they urinate right before they leave the house. They try not to drink a lot of fluids before they're going to the theater or to a movie. Um, and that works at first while the symptoms are, are fairly mild. But most men uh, end up progressing to worsening symptoms. So then we talk about first-line therapies, which are BPH medications. There's also some supplements that uh, men use. Also included in these first-line therapies are Resume, water vapor therapy, and also the uh, Eurolift procedure or the prostatic urethral lift. Uh, they mentioned microwave therapy here, which was a treatment that really has not been done much in the past five years or so because it was not uh, found to be very effective. Other options, if the first-line therapies either don't work or are not a good option for a patient, there are surgical procedures. I mentioned the TERP. That is a procedure that is still considered the gold standard for treatment of BPH because it does work. However, I haven't done one of those procedures in probably 12 or 13 years, uh, simply because there are other less invasive ways to treat the BPH and cause a lot less side effects. And one of those is the green light laser, uh, which is an excellent procedure. I do a lot of those. And in certain circumstances, there are men who require a little bit more of a procedure than the first line therapies like Resume. What about supplements or alternative medicine? There's really no agents that have found to be very effective uh, for BPH. Uh, there are probably a hundred or so supplements out there on the market. The supplement industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and so there's a lot of men that are on them. There, the most common one was saw palmetto. Um, but there were a few studies about five years ago that said that there really wasn't much of a difference between uh, saw palmetto and placebo in terms of treating men's BPH. Now, of course, I have patients who come in and say they're taking this and it's helping them. It's not going to hurt. Um, so I, I tell them if they're happy with it, then they should stay on it. So watchful waiting or observation, really that's the category of people that are kind of managing their lives with behavioral modifications. Typically patients that see me have already progressed beyond this stage and are interested in having something done. So what about the medication? So the first medication that we typically use is one of the alpha blockers. The most common ones are Flomax, uh, Uroxetrol, and Rapiflow. Uh, the generics for those which are out now are Tamsulosin, Alfusis, and Solotusin. I'd say there's about a 75% chance that the medications do help, but about 25 to 50% of patients have pretty significant side effects. I'd say the most common is nasal congestion. A lot of men can have drops in blood pressure, um, which can lead to dizziness and fainting. And I've had a couple of patients who, you know, fainted and fell and, and hit their head. The medications are not uh, perfect. Certainly a lot of patients are on them and some patients do want to try them. Uh, before they move on to a procedure. Uh, one of the other side effects that I just want to mention with the medications, it's fairly common, about a 25% chance of something called retrograde ejaculation, where when you ejaculate, the semen does not come out the penis, it goes back up into the bladder. That doesn't harm anything, it just, um, a lot of men make uh, say that it does not feel uh, very satisfying. 
Another factor with medications is drug discontinuation. A lot of patients, well, they discontinue because of side effects. They also discontinue because they just forget to take them all the time. Another a class of medications called the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, better known as uh, Avidart and Proscar or Dutesteride and Finasteride, is they reduce the amount of testosterone in the prostate. They actually do shrink the prostate probably by about 30 to 40 percent. But the problem is that they it takes about six to 12 months before you see any improvement in the symptoms, and only about 50 percent of men get improvement in symptoms. So it's not a drug that I typically uh, recommend as a first-line therapy. The side effects with these medications are erectile dysfunction, uh, lowering of libido, and it can also lower the PSA by 50%, which may make it more challenging to follow a patient and diagnose prostate cancer. So let's move on to some of the procedures, and I'm going to start with Resume. So as I, ex I think I explained already, I got involved with Resume during the clinical trial. I have a lot of experience with it dating back to 2013. It has become a big part of my practice because I think it's a very excellent treatment. It's an in-office, non-surgical therapy that reduces BPH symptoms by using the energy in water vapor or steam. When that energy is converted back to liquid water, a tremendous amount of energy is released and that energy destroys the cell membranes, which the body then comes in and cleans up the tissue and reduces the Part of the prostate that's causing a block. Benefits are that it's very minimally invasive. Most treatments literally take me between one and three minutes, and I do 95% of them under local anesthesia. So patients can literally walk out of the office without needing a ride, without having general anesthesia. There are potential side effects. Um, you may need a catheter. Most patients actually need a catheter for at least a few days after the procedure. You can have the blood and the urine, but all these things go away. And I would say that the majority, vast majority of patients are very happy uh, with the results. What are some of the benefits of this? Does it require general anesthesia? No, it requires a prostate block, which basically I just numb up the prostate. Um, there are no permanent implants placed, so there's no foreign body placed into the prostate. The five-year data just came out for surgical retreatment, and there's a 4.4% chance of needing another procedure done through five years, which is a very, it compares very favorably to other procedures out there. Resume uses the natural energy stored in water vapor, or steam. It is a safe and effective treatment available to relieve symptoms associated with benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. During each nine-second treatment, sterile water vapor is released throughout the targeted prostate tissue. When the steam turns back into water, all the stored energy is released, causing the cells to die. Over time, your body's natural healing response removes the dead cells, shrinking the prostate. With the extra tissue removed, the urethra opens, reducing BPH symptoms. Most patients begin to experience symptom relief in as soon as two weeks, and maximum benefit will occur within three months. So I'm going to touch on the other procedures that are available. So the prostatic urethral lift, uh, otherwise known as a urolift. So it is also a non-surgical outpatient procedure. And what it does is it uses these little metal implants to push the sides of the prostate away to create a better channel. It also does not require general anesthesia. It does have these permanent implants that are, are left in the prostate. And the five-year data uh, says that there's a 13.6 chance of needing another procedure done within the first five years. You remember compared to the resume procedure, which was 4.4%. Uh, another treatment that I mentioned before, green light laser, so green light laser is a, is a good procedure that uh, does have to be done under general anesthesia, and it uses laser energy to vaporize uh, the prostate tissue away. It's a procedure that I also do a lot of. Um, there are some men who choose the green light laser over resume for different reasons. Uh, there are some men who I just don't think are good candidates for the resume procedure, and I do recommend the green light laser therapy. One of those issues is in some men who are emptying their bladder very poorly, in other words, that post-void residual, men have a large amount of urine in the bladder, 
then the resume procedure is not a very good idea, and that's when I typically recommend the green light laser. Again, very similar to the resume, the surgical retreatment rate for five years is about 4.3%, uh, which is pretty much the same. And here's the transurethral resection of the prostate. It is, as I said, considered the gold standard. It does give patients good symptomatic relief. Uh, however, it also has the potential to cause a uh, some more side effects, including erectile dysfunction uh, in about 5 to 10% of men, which Resume does not have. Uh, there's also a chance of retrograde ejaculation that approaches 100%, whereas with Resume, the chance of that is about 5%. So it's a procedure that is still done by some urologists. However, in my opinion, it's a procedure that really does not need to be done anymore because there are newer, less invasive treatments that offer just as uh, effective improvement in urinary symptoms. Another procedure that actually does have a place is called the open prostatectomy. Another uh, name for that is the laparoscopic simple prostatectomy, and that's usually for patients who have extremely large prostates, bigger than about 200 grams, where we don't think that the resume or the other minimally invasive treatments will help. And therefore, this is a, a bigger open uh, or laparoscopic procedure that usually requires a hospitalization, um, but I only reserve for men who have extremely large prostates. It just got to be harder and harder to pee, basically. And uh, by this last year, I just decided it had been it got worse and worse. I mean, I could go in a, in a movie and have to go to the bathroom three times, or and it'd take a long time to go to the bathroom, so I got tired of it. I was reluctant to use any of the standard prescription drugs that people were using, so I tried some uh, um, over-the-counter and their natural drugs, and uh, they worked for a while, but after a while it just didn't work at all. I didn't know about Resume until I met my urologist, but uh, um, I did, and I didn't want to have some of the regular surgeries that they talked about. I, didn't, I, I didn't, was reluctant to do that, so meeting that urologist was the best thing that I did. I decided to go ahead with Resume because I had looked online and saw that there were side effects with drugs or some of the surgical procedures that I didn't want to go through. And the procedure didn't last very that long. I was surprised, I thought it'd take longer, but it didn't. Everything was done in the doctor's office. I mean, they didn't have to go to the hospital or any of that. And uh, uh, I was, I, I mean, I actually drove home. So uh, <laughs> it wasn't a bad thing at all. After having the procedure where I am now, five months later, I mean, it's just totally different. I have no problems whatsoever. I sleep at night. I still get up once in a while, but I had nothing like before. I uh, would get up many times a night before to go to the bathroom. Don't have any of that now. It's back again like I was literally 30 years ago or something. I have already recommended it to other people. I said it's the best thing I've done, and uh, I wouldn't wait. Why wait? I, it's just it's not going to get better. So you need to take care of it in some way, and this is. Uh, I just can't recommend it enough. I mean, it's just so different, it's unbelievable. In summary, um, you know, we've talked about uh, BPH, we've talked about uh, what the treatment options are, including observation, the first line treatments, and surgical procedures. I am happy to stick around and answer questions for everyone. So we've got a bunch of questions in so far, Dr. Levin. First one up, how long does a resume procedure take? Uh, so the resume procedure, uh, it depends on the size of the prostate, but I would say it takes anywhere between one and three minutes. It's incredibly quick. Each steam treatment takes nine seconds. And so depending on the size of the prostate and the length of the prostatic urethra, determines how many treatments I do. The least number of treatments that I've done is two, and the most is 15. You know, even if you have 15 treatments, um, each is only nine seconds. So, you know, you're talking two and a half to three minutes for even the biggest of prostates. Is the procedure painful at all? So the procedure does involve some discomfort. And what I like to tell people is if your discomfort 
during the cystoscopy is not very significant, then you'll very easily be able to tolerate the resume. Uh, so, you know, I usually ask people what their pain score is during the cystoscopy. And most patients are in the one to three range for one being a little scratch, 10 being the worst pain you could ever imagine in your life. So most patients are a one to three on the cystoscopy, which means they'll be about a two to five during the resume procedure. What is the difference between the retreatment weight between your lift and resume? You may have uh, talked about that earlier in slides, but someone's asking about the so specific the, matchup. You know, I can just tell you what the five-year data show. So that means the patients in, the, in that trial were followed for five years. And with resume, the percent of patients needing another procedure done at five years was 4.4%. Whereas the Eurolift, it was 13.6% of needing another procedure within five years. Are there any notable differences between Resume and Eurolift when it comes to symptom relief? So I think the symptom relief is about the same. I don't know the, the symptom relief with in the, in the clinical trial, the symptom relief with, with Resume was 12 points on that IPSS score I told you about, I think that the, the symptom relief on Eurolift was about the same. Now, I will tell you that most patients get symptom relief quicker with the Eurolift procedure than they do with Resume. And the reason for that is that, as I explained, with Eurolift, you're just pushing the lateral lobe tissue away so that you can urinate more freely, and that happens fairly quickly. With Resume, you're putting the steam in, it kills the cells, but that tissue is still there. And it takes about two to four weeks before the body starts resorbing that tissue and before you start getting a nice open channel to urinate through. So what I find is that most of my patients are starting to get some pretty good improvement by a month. Um, the full improvement is probably not for about three or four months, although some patients have pretty darn good improvement by four to six weeks. But I, I do definitely think that Eurolift, your symptoms will improve more quickly, for sure. Is Resume an option after uh, a patient's already had a Eurolift or green light, TERP, or Interstim? Yes. I have done Resume on now two or three patients after a Eurolift, a few patients after a, a green light laser. I don't know that I've ever done one on somebody that has had a TERP, but that wouldn't be a problem. I mean, if for instance, let's say somebody had a TERP 10 or 15 years ago and the, the BPH continues to grow and they now have new BPH that's causing a blockage, then sure, Resume would work just as well. Um, how large can a prostate be for a candidate to be uh, considered for Resume? So that's a very good question. Um, and I actually forgot to mention prostate size, but when, when Resume was approved by the FDA. It was approved for prostates 30 to 80 grams. I am currently involved in another clinical trial for extra large prostates. It's called Resume XL for prostates anywhere from 80 to 150 grams. That study is ongoing, but I can tell you that without revealing any specifics that I've treated 20 patients on that study and they are doing very well. I also treat patients larger than 80 grams in my private practice and I've had excellent results. I probably wouldn't recommend it for a prostate that's 200 grams, although I have done one that was 204 grams, but typically I don't recommend it once they start getting to be that big. One other thing I forgot to mention is I, I mentioned earlier about the middle lobe, which is that part of the prostate that sticks up into the middle that's like putting your finger on a garden hose. So Resume treats that middle lobe very well. Um, and I sometimes put just one treatment into the middle lobes, oftentimes two treatments. And, and on two or three cases, I've done three treatments into the middle lobe, just depending on how, how big it is. That's another interesting difference between Resume and Eurolift. With Eurolift, they cannot treat, uh, that, that procedure cannot treat a, a large middle lobe. Um, but Resume can treat almost any shape and size prostate until you get up to the very large prostates. We do have a bunch of questions regarding whether insurance covers. I, I don't want to get too specific about it. All insurances are different, mm -hmm. but currently all insurance companies cover Resume. We had, a, we had some trouble about a year or so ago when there were some uh, commercial insurance companies that were not covering it, but, but currently all the insurances that we typically see at Chesapeake Urology are now covered 
uh, now cover reason. And I was going to add on to that too. Uh, you, you can always call our office and we can do a check for you to make sure that you're uh, fully covered. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The, they can check to see your specific insurance, uh, what the coverage is. And we certainly let patients know, you know, if they're going to have any out of pocket co-pays or, or what have you, um, certainly before the procedure. Got a few questions about the catheter. Um, how long do you need the catheter after a resume? procedure? Is it one that can be removed from home? Just a, a few questions regarding the uh, catheter after a resume procedure. Okay. So first of all, I actually didn't touch on the catheter too much. So if I do the resume awake, which I do 90, 95% of the time, um, if the prostate is not too large, then I allow men to try and urinate right there. And if they can urinate most of the fluid that we put in during the procedure, then you can go home without a catheter. I would say realistically, only about 25% of men go home without a catheter. If you need a catheter, then the length of, of time that I like to leave the catheter in depends on the size of the prostate and the number of treatments that I've done. So it's anywhere from two to seven days. Most patients, I would say, are two to, two to four days. As far as removing the catheter, I have all of my patients take the catheter out at home early in the morning. That way, if they have any trouble with urination, they can call the office and come in and I can I can take care of the problem. And that seems to work out very well. Removing a catheter is extremely simple. It takes about five to 10 seconds, and I have patients do it in the shower um, early in the morning. If the procedure does need to be redone, is it the exact same procedure again, or is there any difference to it? I mean, it's, it's a similar procedure. You know, if, if a patient didn't get any improvement from the resume, I would hesitate to recommend doing it again. I would recommend doing something else, but I would say that that has happened to me maybe once or twice in the 330 procedures that I've done. You know, more typically, it's that somebody has a good result and then three, four years later, not as good as it was, and they decide they want to have it done. And I've probably done that about four or five times, either doing another resume or doing a green light laser, just depending on patient preference. But it can certainly it can certainly be done again. A gentleman had brachytherapy for a cancer diagnosis. Does that limit his options for BPH treatment? So treating treating for BPH after having radiation can be very difficult because the radiation can cause a lot of fibrosis and scar tissue of the prostate. That being said, you know, of the procedures that are out there, um, I think Resume is a good one to do if someone needs a BPH procedure after radiation because it's one of the least invasive and it's unlikely to cause any significant problem. We like to wait at least a year after radiation, whether it's brachytherapy or external radiation, before we recommend doing anything with the prostate. I have done that in a few cases. How does age and weight affect the recommended course of treatment? I mean, it doesn't necessarily. It's more patient health than age or weight. You know, I have treated some very heavy patients. Um, it's done under local anesthesia. So that, you know, is a, is a, a very a good thing for patients who are obese. Um, certainly doing something, a procedure under local anesthesia is much safer than a procedure that requires anesthesia. Now, one thing I didn't mention also is that I typically don't recommend doing resume for patients who are in retention. However, I have done that on 12 patients that were in retention, meaning they had a catheter and they were too sick to have one of the other procedures that I would typically recommend, like green light laser for somebody in retention. But these patients were too sick to have general anesthesia so I agreed to do resume on them, including the guy who had a 204 gram prostate. And 10 out of 12 of those patients were able to urinate after the procedure at some point. Definitely takes longer. They need a catheter in for perhaps a month or two after that. But some of these patients came to me and had a catheter for six months, to six to 12 months to start with. Um, so if it's a last resort, I would consider doing room on somebody that's in retention. That's but uh, to go back to your question, as far as the weight, you know, it's really, I don't know that there's a patient that I've turned down because of weight alone. Um, if you can lie down, you know, uh, and do the procedure under local anesthesia, then there should be no reason why we, why you couldn't have it done. Gentleman asked if uh, you can actually be placed under twilight anesthesia for a resume or a Eurolift. So actually wanting to be, uh, under twilight. So that's a very good question. So that is where insurance comes into play. Um, I would say that the majority of insurances do not cover resume done 
son asleep, uh, including Medicare. Why that is, I can't even begin to tell you because I don't know. Um, but that's just the way our Medicare uh, insurance system works. And, and a lot of private carriers as well don't allow uh, me to put patients to sleep for resume. For Eurolift, that's not, um, that's not a problem. Most insurances do allow going to sleep for Eurolift. But I would say the majority of insurances um, resume has to be done awake. There is one insurance that allows patient to choose, or common insurance that allows patients to choose. But even those patients of mine, 90% of them choose to have it done awake, just because of the benefits. The you know the chance of not needing a catheter, not having to fast the night before, not having to have somebody drive you home, not having to go see your regular doctor have pre-ops done history, physical blood work, EKG before the procedure. So even the patients that could be done asleep, um, most of them elect to have it done away. If a resume procedure doesn't turn out to be effective, are there other options uh, such as Eurolift still available to patients? So having resume does not burn any bridges and the other treatments are certainly still available. And I, I would say that I have a handful of patients who Resume just was not effective and went on to another treatment, uh, most commonly green light laser. Uh, but I would say it's probably five patients out of the 330 that I've done so far. So it's, it's way less than 1%. So great segue into the next question. A gentleman asks, uh, what's the advantages or comparison of Resume to the green light laser? I'm not sure what you mean by comparison, but I'll go through the differences. And, and it's, it's very often that I have a conversation with a patient and tell them, okay, you're a candidate for any of these procedures. And it's often time that my patients are deciding between green light laser and Resume. I mean, the big difference is that Green light under general anesthesia, less than five minutes done awake. Um, so that's one of the primary differences. As far as the catheter, there is definitely a, a longer a need for a longer catheter with resume. On average, probably two to four days versus with a green light laser, it's just overnight. Another major difference is the chance of retrograde ejaculation, which is a lot higher with a green light laser, about 40% and about 5% with resume. But the biggest difference is just that, you know, it, it takes a lot longer to do a green light laser, an hour asleep, but the catheter time is shorter, whereas resume, less invasive, less chance of retrograde ejaculation. And, you know, there are some patients who choose one versus the other for various of those reasons that I just went through. Now, there are some patients who I tell you really are not a good candidate for resume. I think you should have the green light laser, either because the cystoscopy was very uncomfortable and their insurance doesn't allow them to be asleep for resume. Or if they have too much urine in their bladder to start with, their post-void residual, it's more than about 300 milliliters, then I don't recommend resume and I steer patients more toward the green light laser. On the other hand, you know, the patients, as I explained to you, that either don't want to have general anesthesia or too sick to have general anesthesia, then resume is the perfect option for them as it's done under local anesthesia. How long are most people out of work after a resume procedure? I mean, it, you know, it depends what you do. It depends how, if you, if you end up having a catheter, if the catheter bothers you. I mean, certainly there would be no restrictions to somebody going back to work the next day. Uh, even if you had a catheter, you wear a little bag that's strapped to your leg. And, and so nobody would even know that you have it on. So I have, you know, a lot of patients who... Go back to work the next day. A lot of people like to take a few days off and, and get out of the catheter. I mean, it's very variable. I had, a, I had a physician from Toronto who I did the procedure on. He didn't need a catheter. I did his procedure at 9 a.m. and he flew back to Toronto on a 12 o'clock flight. He was back to seeing patients within a day or two. You know, it's real variable. I wouldn't want to say that everyone could go back to work the next day. I would say for most people, it's probably a few days. Do any of the procedures that you mentioned uh, earlier come with a higher infection risk? Um, I think they're all a very low chance of infection and all about the same. I don't think there's a, a big difference. So I think the, the chance of infection with any of these procedures are under 5%. I don't think there's a big difference uh, between them. Are you the only one that can perform a resume procedure in Chesapeake or are there other providers? No, there are, there are several doctors that, that do them now. You can actually, you can go on our website and it shows which doctors uh, do this procedure 
or you can just call the office. Um, you know, as a lot of you may or may not know, we have quite a few offices that expand all the way from uh, Southern Maryland, the DC area, all the way up to Northern Maryland, Haver de Grace. There are certainly physicians in our other geographic locations uh, that could take care of you if you're not near near us in Towson. Another patient asked, uh, is there a uh, is there long-term fibrosis in the urethra after a resumed procedure? Uh, not that we know of. I mean, I have done a cystoscopy on a lot of men after a resume and the urethra looks very normal. Um, in the clinical trial that we did, we did a cystoscopy on everyone at six months. And so there was no obvious evidence of any urethral scarring or anything like that. I've also done um, cystoscopies on men that also have bladder cancer that need to get a cystoscopy once a year. And no, I, I see no, no scar, no increased incidence of scar tissue than I would for any other patient. Are there any issues for a patient who is taking blood thinners to have the resume procedure? Yes. So I typically, um, typically like patients to stop the blood thinners if it's safe for them if their cardiologist uh, or their medical doctor feels it's safe for a few days. However, I have done resumes on patients that have continued their anticoagulation, including warfarin, Plavix, Eliquis. You know, there is a little bit higher, not, not life-threatening bleeding, just bleeding that may cause some issues with blood clots clogging the catheter, you know, things that are more of a nuisance than anything that's a serious medical issue. If a patient has a high risk of a repeat heart attack or stroke, if they came off of their anticoagulation medicines, then I would have them continue. It's always my preference to discontinue them if it's safe to do so. I had a couple of questions regarding uh, PSA levels, um, if the procedure affects their PSA. It does. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't really studied well in the clinical trial, but I can tell you just from my clinical practice of treating patients that most patients, the PSA goes down after resume, which makes sense because you're, you're getting rid of some of the glands that, the enlarged glands that make PSA. So I would say the average reduction in PSA is probably 20 to 30%. I have seen some patients' uh, PSA go down as much as 50%, and I've also seen some patients who it really doesn't change. So, but I think for the most part, you know, it just makes sense that you're getting rid of some of the tissue that makes the PSA, and therefore you'd expect a little bit of a reduction. Okay, another gentleman asked uh, if there's any data regarding the number of times patients have to urinate the night after the procedure. Well, as I, as I said, 75% uh, of patients go home with a catheter, so they're not urinating. It just drains into the catheter bag. And as far as the patients that go home without a catheter, I don't have any data on that. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have time for now. I think we'll just close it out with telling people how they could... Uh, take the next steps to make an appointment with you and uh, or, or with one of our one of your colleagues. So again, if you want to make an appointment with Dr. Levin or any of the Chesapeake Urology doctors, you can visit our website at chesapeakeurology.com. You can also uh, make a telehealth appointment, which obviously during these times is, is a little bit safer. We can do a, a an initial appointment via telehealth. You can self-schedule that appointment through our website, or you can call 866-953-3111. I'd like to thank our uh, presenter today, Dr. Levin. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules. Um, I hope, hope this was educational, informative,